Hello there, everybody. Welcome back to Star Wars Lads. We've got a big episode to talk with you all about from, from The Bad Batch Season 3. This was Episode 9, The Harbinger. And we have our first appearance of Asajj Ventress. We've all been waiting for it for a while, talking about it basically every week since we started doing these Bad Batch Lives all the way back with Episode 1, 2, and 3, dropping at the same time. And we finally get our Asajj Ventress appearance. We're going to talk about the episode, her appearance, all the predictions you guys have for maybe the future, some of the reasons maybe why she's in the show, <laughs> more reasons uh, about the future of her role and and what could be the future of this character in Star Wars now that she is, she is uh, well and truly alive. So we're going to get into all that. Send in your questions, your comments, your thoughts, your reviews of The Bad Batch Season 3, Episode 9. Your predictions for episode 10 and 11 next week is a double episode. Also, uh, your your theories on Asajj Ventress. Why is she back? What's her role in the show? What's her role in the future of Star Wars? Send all of that into the chat. We're going to get to it as soon as we can. But we're going to start out these episodes like we always do. And we're going to give you our thoughts on the latest episode of The Bad Batch. So let's get into it right here, Senek. Uh, you were watching The Bad Batch Season 3, Episode 9 last night what were your thoughts watching last night's episode i mean i i really did like it it just wasn't exactly what i expected i always thought that the title was going to be a little bit less up front right i thought we'd get a size maybe as a tag as opposed to just hiding in a cavern <laughs> right. right and, and pabu of old places right and hey i mean I, I love her ship design that is one of the coolest ships i've seen um you know, I think people always say Cad Bane's is an underrated one, and Phoenix, you know, is okay. I wasn't too impressed by the design, but this one, I was like, yeah, that's yeah, that's a starship right there. That's worthy of like one of the most famous characters <laughs> since the early two thousands. Um, but yeah, I I didn't really expect this to sort of become like a pseudo like Jedi training episode, yeah. and I really didn't expect it to not address too many of the issues there like yeah i know at the at the very end uh asajj is like kind of saying like you know uh, you just take i uh, just lost like one of my many more lives left in me or whatever I, I don't really know exactly how she said it but i was like okay now that like sort of ties into some very important plot elements of dark disciple and i know i think it was corbett she tweeted out like make sure you're <laughs> freshen up on dark disciple and all that so Everyone expected it because like, oh, Asajj is going to be back. But in my mind, it was a little bit more now because of the very like important like plot elements, the, you know, the environment of Dathomir, especially where she's from, that's seemingly going to be very important. A lot of stuff that I've been mentioning is very like, Dune inspired in some ways, uh, quite literally with some of the titles. So maybe that's an explanation like is he now suddenly like basically a cat with nine lives is she the cat woman of, <laughs> of the star wars universe i don't know but in a lot of ways i think my only real issue with this episode is that every other episode that we've gone feels like it's built up towards something whether it be like the character reintegrations or you know dealing with the very heavy plot of tantis and the chase for omega and all that or like just Omega and Across are escaping, right? This one, I was like, okay, this this essentially feels like a backdoor pilot, right? Like it's not just me, right? That feels like this, you know, it's just out there. Like, yeah, I, I mean, I love seeing Asajj back. It does feel like Asajj, but I know they even put an article out there just like, we're going to tell more about like and explain a lot more things about her return, just not necessarily in the Bad Batch. So now my worry is like, is she not going to have any role further in the season? Because I feel like yeah. you still need to like develop her as a character, not just be like Fennec sent me. Like, how does Fennec know everybody, man? Like, I get it. <laughs> you know, like it's cool to take a live action character, bring them to animation, and you know, just continue strengthening their position in the Star Wars universe. But <laughs> this is a side of entry, presumed dead, right? Buried. Right. What what does that mean? And we still haven't gotten an answer to that. We haven't gotten an answer necessarily if Omega is super force sensitive. I mean, I guess they are saying that she is, but I, I'm, I'm not convinced yet because I feel like there would have been something about Omega that would have been drawn out, would 
the way Osage was definitely like forcing her through these tests and all that. Um, I guess they really want us to tune into next week's doubleheader and everything else. But a- as it is right now, I'm just like, okay, that was fun. That was cool. What does it mean? <laughs> right. Yeah, that's the big thing coming from this episode. And and I agree in a lot of ways where like this is your typical kind of once a season in every show Star Wars episode where it's exciting. There's things happening. New characters are back or old characters are back in new ways. Right. Uh, but what did this episode do? Um, <laughs> like Omega is is af- the Empire's after. Her. And I and I thought it was funny, too, because a lot of this episode uh, the Bad Batch are saying a lot of the things I was thinking, right? Like yeah. Crosshair is like, who cares why Omega is important? They're after her anyways. We got to keep her safe. <laughs> and I was like, yeah. exactly. Like, you right. know, like I want to know why Omega is important, but also like, does it really matter if she has M count or not? They're still after her. So, I mean, frankly, it only matters for us. I did love, I did love, I wrote this down in my notes. Finally, finally. Somebody said the word midichlorians. Ventress yes. finally said midichlorians. Uh, you know, M count, great. You know, I want to say, um, you want to say it to keep it gen- diff, maybe for people who aren't caught up on lore, might be confused by midichlorians. Um, the whole idea of midichlorians might have always confused them, or just, you know, the crotchety people who are still hating the prequels, right? And, and just hate the idea of midichlorians, trying to trick them a little bit and make them think sure. it's something different whatever their, their purpose was with M count. Um, finally, somebody said midichlorians. <laughs> so happy to have that back. But yeah, I, I did feel very mixed on this episode um, where at least Ventress being there, some of the things, the seeds that were added for the future. Uh, and, and particularly, uh, you mentioned in the short, the animation in this was absolutely insane. This is really one of the first times we've seen a full-fledged, like powerful Jedi in action or, you know, Jedi character in action, force user. And this time we get to see him with the Bad Batch animation, which has progressed even more so from season seven of the Clone Wars animation. And so I just felt like that was such a treat to get to see. But I just hope this episode, it it just sits weird with me for, for now until next week, right? Like, is this the last we see of Ventress? I don't think it is the way they left it off or the way they've been hyping it up online uh, you referenced an article that we'll, we'll talk about here in a little bit as well but man it, it, if this is the last appearance of interest in this show i i think that's a complete waste like what were yeah. they uh, that would be something that would genuinely even if this season is amazing always sit so bad with me personally as a fan of dark disciple as a fan of this character why like why would you bring her back is it just to try to promote the season and have that big reveal for the first trailer so more people watch the show if that was the case that would be really really frustrating and i really can't think of any good reason why that would be the case Um, i trust this creative team and i think they've done a really strong job the entirety of the bad batch uh, despite some pacing issues outside of that this the team has done a good job with the storytelling and so I figure Ventress is going to pop up in more episodes throughout the season. I don't see her having a major role. Um, I felt like it really was. You said backdoor pilot. And, it, and it's true in that scenario where I'm not necessarily sold on the idea that the next Star Wars animation is purely about Ventress. But in a way, it was just like, yeah, she's back. Here she is. You haven't seen her in a while. This is this is her. She's doing stuff. And, you know, here's her yellow lightsaber. And uh, she's got hair now and look at all the things she's doing. Like, you know, it just, it just felt like a lot of that. Um, well, and the only thing that we really did that progress, progressed the narrative was testing Omega with the fours kind of, but <laughs> it's like you do a bunch of random tests on her, but she's already, you know, a gifted athlete and uh, has some, some training as a soldier, which is even addressed in this, this episode i don't know what ventress's tests really did to confirm or deny that she's force sensitive right like at the end of the episode ventress is like i don't think you have midi a high midi chlorian count 
but they're after you anyways. And I would get off of Pabu. It basically is just setting up next week when Pabu gets raided and destroyed, I'm sure, in the yeah. double episode. <laughs> um, but yeah, there wasn't much that really went on that made me go, okay, why did she need to be here? And so it will be that cautious, that cautious optimism and cautious excitement we had when we reacted to the trailer all the way back in January. That I still have that. And unfortunately, this episode for me didn't do anything to alleviate that nervousness about why is she here? <laughs> you know, I love Ventress as much as the next person, but I loved her ending. It was perfect in Dark Disciple. And even though nobody or less people read that than watch the Bad Batch, it it still was great for a character that has been frankly missing from Star Wars for over 10 years. And you didn't need to bring back like people had moved on. You know, you didn't need to be like, well, you know, not that many people read Dark Disciple. We got to tell her story. She's, she's a big part of the Bad Batch. We got to tell her story. And it's like, no, she's not. She doesn't need to be there. So um, they better do something in this season, particularly that that reaffirms why she needs to be there. Uh, but let's talk about that article real quick. And again, send in your questions or, or comments, theories, everything in the chat. We do have a couple a chat is here um, first from this is the way first time watching you guys live enjoy your channel thanks so much hopefully you're enjoying the stream and uh, we appreciate your support here watching our videos and, and content on the channel danger man asks an interesting question he says i've never seen star wars before <laughs> what should i watch first <laughs> well if you're uh you're if you're joining us for the bad batch review we appreciate it um not the bad batch that's not the first thing you should watch uh, you know, there's two places to start in Star Wars. It's either Phantom Menace or A New Hope. If you really know nothing about Star Wars, I highly recommend starting with A New Hope. But if uh, if you know a lot about Star Wars, I started with The Phantom Menace as a as a you know 90s late 90s kid and prequel era person. And I think you can enjoy Star Wars <laughs> immensely starting with the prequels as well. Right. Yeah. And I, I would add to that, that I actually started off with A New Hope because my dad was watching the Star Trek movies and I guess they didn't have the next one. So he went to the other Star <laughs> series. So Toddler <laughs> Me finally sat down and watched something and it was A New Hope because of the stormtroopers walking in the Death Star hallway. So, you know, anything that catches your eye, I'd argue, is like a good starting point for Star Wars. Uh, but the original, in some ways, is like the simplest story to follow through. It's like everything that you, you know, watch or hear or read about, like around it has come afterwards, right? What we have with that original movie is just the good guys take on the bad guys and win in this like very uplifting story with spirituality, with some political intrigue, you know, with some great action, all this and that, right? So if you want something super simple, yes, a new hope in some ways. But then, like like Liam said, if you watch from the Phantom Menace, yeah, maybe you get some like iconic character reveals spoiled here and there, but they're not like heavy spoilers or anything, um, and they make sense in the context of the story. Uh, but if watching it from one through nine, you get to really see why it's called the Skywalker Saga. I, I think it is a very fair way of watching it. Um, but if you're talking like animated shows, like what to watch first. Again, watch the movies first. If, if you can't watch the movies, uh, then you're not going to have any chance of like really understanding most of the Star Wars shows. I, I guess maybe Rebels and Resistance you can kind of get away with, but definitely not the Clone Wars. You, you, you need to know some very specific context from the Attack of the Clones. So, yeah, either Episode 1 or Episode nine, uh, episode 4. Those are your starting points. Absolutely. All right. Well, moving into this article again, everybody, we've we just gave our little review of the Bad Batch season three, episode nine. Let us know what you think in the comments. Send in your theories, your thoughts, what you think might happen next week, um, your review on this week's episode. What do you think of Ventress being back? Send all that into the chat. We're going to talk about an article here uh, with some of the producers of the Bad Batch that StarWars.com released as well today, talking about Ventress's reappearance. Uh, it's basically all stuff they've said before <laughs> but one thing they did say um which is kind of concerning to me and i don't want to be one of those people that's like oh god you know look at they not uh we don't know what's going on you know like it's it's all a disaster uh but um <laughs> jennifer corbett said in a quote we had several discussions about the book 
meaning Dark Disciple, and how her story could continue. How she survived will be revealed in future content, but for this story, we were thrilled to include her and explore her unique connection to and compassion for Omega. Um, so from that quote, personally, to uh, positive, start with the positive, connection to and compassion for Omega. I saw it in this episode, but that to me sounds like something that is going to be recurring. So hopefully she's showing up more in this show. Negative is, to me, that kind of sounds like, yeah, we thought about how to bring her back and we don't really know yet, but we brought her back and we'll figure it out later. <laughs> um, Sonic, tell me I'm wrong and tell me that that I'm just being too pessimistic in that. Oh, I can't say that, Liam. I can say <laughs> that I'm also a little worried, uh, especially since a lot of this is just very straightforward PR. I, I guess the episode just dropped today. People are still catching yeah. up, so maybe... They just want to get ahead of it for the people like us that are like, eh, you know, like, okay, like, I, I guess, like, we need to, like, make sure that these fanatics are just calm down a little bit. Like, we're, <laughs> we're going to we're gonna deal with it. And, right. you know, in, in a way, like, should we really complain, especially with animated shows with the way they brought back Maul just because, right? <laughs> and it's not like his legs were cut off. His, he was cut through the abdomen clean, right? If he is similar enough to a human, right, and he is a humanoid, Zabrax should not survive with like half their intestines like seared off and all that. But the point is, they made that work. So I'm gonna trust this team, especially with how season three has gone. I think they've learned a lot from Filoni and from all the other writers from the Clone Wars that they were obviously involved with in the production of that show and whatever came out of Rebels as well that has influenced and informed how to like take the storytelling here yeah um i would say yeah definitely lean on the unique connection part like i think that that's the word that sticks out to me because i think you know as much as i want to say like everything about like the dathomir night sister magic the sleeper the water life all these things that we have from dark disciple from the clone wars i don't necessarily believe that it's going to be all super connected and tied up right like I, yes I, I can see elements of that being brought up this early because they want to maybe do a spin-off show with Asajj and maybe they want to have Dathomir and its mysteries be a little bit more prepped out for by the time we see Thrawn on Dathomir because I feel like that's just an eventuality right for the next season of Ahsoka so maybe they are doing some groundwork there per se but that unique connection to me feels like there is something going on with Nala, say, with Kamen Owens, with Omega and her midichlorians or something special about her, the way she was engineered. Even if she is unaltered, maybe a part of her is what's allowed uh, our famous you know, Sith Acolyte to come back from the dead, right? And I, and I know it's very easy to be like, ah, mm, I don't know. I don't like this, right? But that could be something pretty interesting. I think you could see where we've had in the Clone Wars quite frequently where Sidious Dark Side versus Talzin, Night Sister Magic. Night Sister Magic is not necessarily more powerful, but it's very strange. It's very different, almost ethereal in the most gothic way. And I could see that maybe that combination of whatever has allowed her to like rise up from Dathomir and like the soil, the water, like whatever it may be. And the combination of engineering and Kamino and technology makes her come back to life. And they're hoping, hey, like maybe we can make clones out of this or maybe we can do things out of that. Or like they've tried and they've succeeded in some way. Maybe she's not the Saj we know. Maybe she is a clone. But the reason why she's able to use the force and has her memories is her connection with being reborn on Death Marie all the way back in the Clone Wars. I don't know. But I will say that there's that unique thing makes me feel like there is some like very tangible connection with her and Omega. I just, I don't see it just being like, she's cool. And she thinks that girl is cool and they're besties. Right. It's, it's definitely not like that. Cause even that relationship in this episode is like, yeah, she is a little compassionate. She is saying like, I was a separate war hero, a war criminal or hero, depending on the side you guys were, um, consider that to my side of the war but we've all had to deal with it we've been all been thrown away i i, I could definitely see that there is going to be some sort of eh, story story that makes a side come back and you know when, once we deal with it 
in a sequel show or whatnot, or maybe the end of the season will feel better about it because it has very important connections to Omega. But right now, <laughs> I am I'm worried. I just think that whatever they're doing has to honor the book, honor the end of that story, but also kind of go into a little bit more of like the sci-fi, the weird reawakenings, rebirth, cloning, strand cast, all that sort of crazy sure, twisted yeah. like rebirth stuff that has been such a focus especially at the start of this third season yeah and we're still we're still not even into the final third of this season there could be answers i mean i know uh jennifer corbett says literally says here we're not going to tell you why she's back um they say <laughs> that'll be covered in future content so we're not going to know the answer but at least we could get hints hopefully in this season that hey there are some things that are going on here with Ventress that hint at this possible connection you might make to another thing from other material. Um, one thing, though, I love Dave Filoni. I love what he's done for Star Wars. I love all, mostly everything he's done. Um, and I really enjoy the direction he's taken a lot of things in Star Wars. But um, we do know his history with canon, <laughs> especially things that aren't him. And George Lucas is like canon, right? Um, he almost, in a way, sometimes seems to more closely want to honor Legends continuity than even some of the things in canon we've seen. Um, and <laughs> they do say in this, um, Brad Rao does say in the same article, Ventress is one of our all-time favorite characters. So when Dave Filoni brought up the idea of bringing her back into the Bad Batch, we were very excited. Um, so that is the other thing that concerned me. I mean, the thing that I always held up as like, no, nah, they're not going to just retcon Dark Disciple, basically, is, is the fact that, um, and this is kind of getting into your comment here, uh, this is the way where you said, I'm, I'm not trying to hate on Dark Disciple, but unless you're into the books... EU legends, etc. A lot of casual fans didn't know Ventress was dead. Always thought her and Ahsoka should be in future Star Wars. And the reason a lot of us hold Dark Disciple to an even higher standard than most canon material, um, not just because it's an excellent story, but because it was literally uh, Clone Wars episodes. They they were going to be Clone Wars episodes from a canceled season kind of i don't know if it was supposed to be end of season six or season seven because season six got Some, shrunk yeah. down and turned into the netflix season the lost mission season um but it was it was supposed to be eight episodes of the clone wars and it tur got turned into a book it's written by george lucas's daughter right um, yeah <laughs> this is like as close to like the original you know clone wars material as possible as you can possibly get it's not just EU fans or, you know, in, for in this instance, like canon extended material fans. It's this is literal like George Lucas Star Wars, <laughs> Lucas family Star Wars. Uh, Dave Filoni was involved with the story for this entire arc. So that made me a little bit more optimistic that like, you know, he might not have read other material. Um, Ahsoka, you know, he gave initial ideas. They changed for the Ahsoka book what that's whatever you know i don't love that book anyways so <laughs> didn't really care as much if it's contradicted but here i love this book he was involved with the writing of this original like he knew the arc of this original story just because it didn't come to film doesn't mean it didn't happen it got published as a book it got published as a book a long time ago um and so it would be really extremely frustrating if it's just like hey you know yeah you're looking for some cool characters from clone wars to bring back how about, a, how about Asajj Ventress? You know, we never did that story where she died. And it's like, yeah, well, yeah, yeah, you did. It was it was a book. <laughs> um, yeah. And that's a little what I'm worried about is just kind of like, you know, spitballing things to do. How can we bring more Clone Wars characters back? Why not Ventress? If that was really the situation and uh, uh, that that's very much so concerns me. Yeah, and I think it's fair to stay concerned. Um but I want I want to go to Colton's comment. I was skeptical skept, skeptical about how Ventress could be used and still am, but she was badass and interesting. I just hope she's used beyond the show. And I want to point out that interesting line because I think, ironically, she, she was like a way for the first time ever to like acknowledge that there are millions of clones in this galaxy. We've always talked about 
units of clones, like 200,000 units spawn the way and a million more and all, all that stuff, right? But we've never been like, what is a unit? Does it mean like a clone is a unit? How big is the unit? Like just straight yeah. up having her confirm that there are millions of clones. Like it makes the sense of scale that we've always known about this universe time period, like make a little bit more sense now. Uh, so I'm, 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 I'm very glad about that. So if she's at least come here to like explain some things that lore fanatics like us can like resonate with, I'm cool with that. Like she's got a yellow lightsaber. Her animation fighting was insane. I, I, you know, I, I'm not, I'm not worried just yet. And, and, and I'm, 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 I'm just like, you know, walking the tightrope and just not looking down right now. Cause if I look down, then everything might start to unravel. Right. That That's how I'm going to, how I'm going to handle it. That's how I'm going to take it, you know? And I, yeah, yeah, I know like there is like the whole Ahsoka angle that I think we have to consider too, because animation takes way longer right it's in the pipeline for longer than even live action is right, right? like and if anything this story could have been at this bad batch this episode specifically could have been written at the same time as filoni was writing ahsoka and i think people always slightly misunderstand this but filoni did not like write every episode of the clone wars and he wrote some very good ones but some of the best ones that people always like say oh man filoni so good about clone wars he was just like a you know, showrunner for it. He was just a supervising director for it. You know, he wasn't the end all be all for a lot of these best stories. So like him walking over Katie Lucas's story, who is like one of the most underrated writers of the Clone Wars. It, it does concern me because he's already done it with the Bad Batch's premiere episode. That is like the first video that ever popped off for us in this channel where we're like, why is Kanan's origin being changed? Which one do we trust and believe? Is there a way to merge it, right? Yeah. I guess now the question is, is there a way to merge Dark Disciple in? And I, like, again, like this is the way of saying like people don't really care about the book because it's such an early canon book. People more than likely just watch the shows, don't really care about it. I agree. I agree. That's why, like you're saying, Liam, the Ahsoka one, there were just general plot points that Filoni gave out to E.K. Johnston. She wrote it. Mm -hmm. Now how he's handling it is like, all right, I don't have to love it, but I'd rather, I, what I got is way more fleshed out, way more awesome at the end of the Clone Wars Season 7. The way I'm looking at here now is like, okay, yeah, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm just a little concerned because I don't know what that means for the Dark Disciple ending. But if he's writing it, if he wrote this episode or had like some say into what Brad Rao and Jennifer Corbett were doing, I, I want to say that whatever like corpses and everything that were being like transported uh, at the end of Ahsoka into our main Star Wars galaxy again. I would not be surprised if they do something kind of like how Walker Lame Brain is saying, where like she, she chose so injured, she chose to go into like a deep uh, Sith meditation, which we've seen in the High Republic with the Jedi and all that stuff. Maybe in a way that the Night Sisters, the grandmothers, and all that, the corpse is there. They, they don't want to deal with like, okay, we're going to simply just have zombies. Maybe we're just going to put them in like essentially some sort of stasis where they're like very close to death. And then whatever is on Dathomir revives them. Whatever Imperial technology we have revives them and, you know, spikes them up to be like the killing machines that we need to be, right? Maybe that is like what Asajj's introduction is building that foundation for, for a live action show, which mm -hmm. in, in effect is not good for what we have here in the Bad Batch, especially with season three's really strong flow and pacing. But if they do address or like have her look at some things that are like, oh, that's interesting. And then like another a year from now, we see it in uh, the Ahsoka season two. I'll be like, all right, you know, that's good. And then if we get like a hidden pat show with Quinlan or something where we get it explained away, we get to see parts of Dark Disciple animated. I'll be fine with it. It's just the issue is that's going to be like a three, four year wait in totality. It feels like just sure, with yeah. the way animation and live action have to be synced up to you know, really had that effect that we want. So I'm on the tightrope. I'm not looking down. I'm not going to think about it too hard. I'm just happy she's back. <laughs> and, and hey, like, you know, I agree and understand. Um, majority of Star Wars fans don't read the books. I mean, that's something, you know, we talk on a, at a pretty high level about 
books and stuff on this channel and i know it does alienate some people because we've read a lot of the stuff but that's just our star wars fandom experience we don't look down on anybody who hasn't read the book or we don't we you know we appreciate everybody's perspectives who haven't read and not nobody's perspective is lesser than ours just because we've read some star wars books but at the same time uh, i think what feels frustrating is when well i i've said this before i've gone on my canon tirade before is that disney made a uh very big emphasis on just the idea of the reason we're getting rid of the EU is because so much of it contradicts each other. And, you know, we want to make more movies and basically all of Han, Luke and Leia's stories have been told. And if you want to know what's going on with them, you have to read all these other books. So we're going to get rid of that. And we're going to do a canon that we're going to watch over and like, make sure no one doesn't matter if you're a movie or a video game or a book, no one's contradicting what we said we're going to do and we've seen that that hasn't really held true um and you know it was bound to happen you just hope it's not for really big things um and i feel like a character like ventress is is too big to where like yeah you don't see what happens to her after season five of the clone wars but that came out in 20 i believe the last half of it came out in 2013 did we really need that though like i feel like all the fans moved on um, we don't know what happens to Ventress in Legends either. We don't know if she lived or died. What happened to her? You know, I don't know if that was a story they were really going to tell. Um, Dark Disciple, for all intents and purposes, was going to be a legend story if it was in the Clone Wars, you know. So uh, I, I just feel like this was a planned thing. It's a big character moment. It's some one of the few moments in Star Wars canon extended material that has weight, right? It, it somebody died that was important to the star wars universe um and in a continual in the in the fact that canon has continually had stories that really don't carry any weight uh high republic is really the mostly the biggest one because all those characters created for the books it was nice to have something that had a little bit of weight in star wars canon books like legends books did um where legends back in the day things were contradicted all the time because i mean uh lucas made it very clear my stuff is above everybody else's so you can write whatever you want but if i don't like it i'm going to contradict it that was always clear so you knew what you're getting into i think with the disney canon the promise of hey it's not nothing's going to get contradicted when then then you contradict stuff that's really frustrating as 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 a star wars fan who does read the stuff you know other stuff so not that it's a, a not that my opinion should be any greater than anyone else's. It's just the opinion of a fan who reads the books. It's very frustrating when you're all all in on a franchise from every aspect. Um, it's very frustrating when you don't respect that side of the fandom and you prefer to respect the majority when you said you, that's not what you were going to do. So that that's where I'm coming from as a book fan. Um, but, you know, can't discount the fact that they say it's the reason she's alive is going to be revealed in other material. Could it? It could be a book. Could be Tales of the Jedi season two, which Dave Filoni has a big uh, hand in. You have the animation from Ventures brought back. You could tell her she was once a Jedi. She's kind of running down that path again. She's not a Jedi, but she maybe she is a Jedi. Um, that's kind of a gray thing in Dark Disciple. Could be there. We're going back to Dathomir and Ahsoka. Maybe we're getting live action Ventress. Could be there. Jeez. It's all Filoni. Um, according to <laughs> Brad Rao, could this all be connecting? I mean, there are ways to obviously, it's going to suck no matter what the Dark Disciple is ignored. No matter what, it's going to suck. But are, there are ways to make it so that it's like, yeah, the possibilities of what we get here in the future are so exciting that even myself as somebody who ranks dark disciple in my top 10 favorite star wars books of all time can go okay you know that's that was amazing that book but what we have going on over here that's pretty hype as well yeah i mean i i don't know i i, I wouldn't say live action i feel like that's <laughs> that's a that's a long long way for her to live and she is a enemy to both the sith and to some degree the jedi still right so or whoever is going to be around her i feel like would be aware of her the separatists maybe has some files i don't know like that if if these regular well they're not regular these defective clones right can find information on her quickly 
I would not be surprised if the entire underworld has all the information that at this point they're starting to get more and more power and influence, especially uh, with the Empire with taking missions on for them for M count and all that. So, yeah, I I I don't I don't want to dismiss that concern because it, it is it is it's very true. And I mean, look, my background you can kind of see some posters. I got this like little frame of like a mini cell from special edition M. Fire Strikes Back, some Legos and stuff like that. Liam, you've got the books, like every Legends book, every canon book. I understand. And I've read all these. Okay, maybe not all of them, but I've read pretty <laughs> close to the amount that you've read, right? But seeing these books every day, I think also has a little bit of an impact on you than maybe it does for me. So that's why I, I can totally understand where you're coming from. And I, I'm still a canon junkie in the sense that I don't want these things to be ignored. Uh, but maybe Tales of the Jedi is bigger in its season two. Maybe we just randomly have an eight episode arc just played out, right? And that is just Dark Disciple fully adapted. Maybe some tweaks here and there, but hopefully nothing that like, changes the plot in any major way. Uh, maybe it has a little bit more tie-ins to Count Dooku's story in the first season and his uh, Dooku Jedi Lost audio drama, right? Like, Maybe they're trying to make that story, juice it up a little bit more, put it out in animation. Not necessarily have the same maturity that was upped in the Darkest Type book itself. But regardless, if we can get like 90 to 95% of that story told, that'd be incredible. If not, if we can at least see like her death and then resurrection, I think that's pretty good. I think that's all we can really ask for. And if that happens in season two and we just have an episode of her like wandering until you know Quinlan shows up and I mean that, that brings up a whole other question right like can yeah. this book simply be ignored like I, like you guys are saying in the chat right that we don't need her in live action you know it's book uh, fans don't necessarily have precedence over animation fans in the sense that there's not as many of them I totally agree fully agree and on board on on all those things but if you bring back Asajj now you have to bring back Quinlan and we can't ignore the Dark Disciple story because Quinlan is arguably a more important character to that. He is He's the lead. huge. He goes through essentially his Star Wars Republic comic arc in a little mm. bit more of a, a compelling way as opposed to being just an edge lord. I know people love him <laughs> in, in the Republic series, right? But yeah. I will say what I was found really appealing was that I understood his reasons and just how serious the nature was and how a lot of his own fall per se came because of the Jedi's decisions, which I think is always great to reflect on the failings of the Jedi, especially mm -hmm. as they get further and further in the Clone Wars. So are we going to raise the Dark Disciple book? I don't think so, because whenever we bring Quinlan back, I feel like there's even more story that has to be honored there than even Asajj's. Asajj's and arguably the ending is the only thing that you have to tr truly care about. You bring back Quinlan, then there's a dynamic between them. Then there is the whole history of what they're doing. Then you have to understand connections to back to the Clone Wars that could still be impacting stuff in right. the Bad Batch Honors timeline. There's there's a lot there that I, I'm sure, and if, if not, I almost guarantee it. Maybe not a Charles Barkley guarantee, but I guarantee, <laughs> guarantee. that it's... Guarantee. Like, right? I, I, I guarantee that it's going to be rel even more relevant when Quinlan eventually shows up because we know he's confirmed for the path in Kenobi, right? So... Yep. There's this weird like pocket of like a maybe a two season show or some animated film or something that deals with these characters that could, you know, elevate Dark Disciple once more and still tell its own story and still have these characters essentially continue on where we left them off in like season five of the Clone Wars and then jumping back into where we are in animation today. So, sure. Again. Like I'm saying, tightrope. <laughs> Don't look down. The more you look down, the more the the heights sway you, and then you you get all sweaty. You're like, oh my god, and it's just stuck in here. Just there's no ground, right? I'm up in the air and I'm flying. That's all I gotta believe. I I'll try. To, I'm holding on to the tightrope. Like I fell off, and I'm <laughs> my my one hand is holding it. Um, luckily, I have a strong grip, so I'm holding on till the end of episode 15 of the bad batch and then we'll see where where i am with that it might be like one finger on but uh, um, <laughs> uh going back to the comment section and again for all of you who might just be joining us 
We're going to take your questions, your comments, your theories about episode 10 and 11, anything you want to talk about with the Bad Batch or any other Star Wars topic or any topic you want, whatever, send it into the chat. We will get to it. Uh, and if you would like to make sure your chat is, is taken and you'd like to support the channel, you can send in a super chat and we'd greatly appreciate any support you can show there. Um, but if not, we will continue to work our way down from uh, first come, first serve. People who send in the chats earliest. And so we've kind of brushed over a lot of the things in the chat so far. Um, Colton, you're saying you saying you were skeptical about Ventress returning. Um, also, it said that <laughs> Jennifer Corbett's explanation was uh, low key crazy. Uh, and, and yeah, I mean, it frankly is. I I I didn't expect a big explanation because obviously, if that story is being told, like if they're actively in the process of telling that story, she's not going to spoil anything. Um, so I'm not expecting some big reveal, but, uh, you know, I was hoping for more of a tease, right? Like, hey, you know, you know, we know people love this book, kind of what they did back in January when they had the quotes. It was like, we know people love this book and you'll just have to wait to see what fi and find out um, how she's back. But now they're basically saying, well, yeah, we know people love the book, but you're going to have to wait to some other material <laughs> to see how she's back. Um, so, uh, yeah, that concerns me. But yeah, low key, crazy explanation. Also says, I agree that the animation was incredible and amazing to see its development from early Clone Wars. Yeah, let's talk about that, too. Let's get a little positive here for a second. Um, the animation, the fight scene in this was absolutely insane. Um, I loved also, by the way, love that in this episode that um, we haven't touched on the separatist angle much since season one. Um, we saw Senator Singh a couple episodes ago. He was kind of the last time we talked about the separatists in the Bad Batch. But these are clones. And even though... Clone Force 99 is different and doesn't necessarily get along with their brothers and doesn't see themselves maybe as clones. They are clones. They fought in this war. They killed many, many droids and a lot of separatist leaders probably throughout the war. And here you have one of the most fearsome separatist leaders out there, one who killed countless clones as well, right in front of them. Uh, I enjoyed seeing what that did to them you know their their distrust i enjoyed seeing their reaction it made sense and they needed to have a fight scene like that you know like there's no way these guys are just letting her show up <laughs> i mean omega didn't deal with the war these guys fought people like ventress grievous dooku i i enjoyed seeing that and then it also added just another layer to what they can do the speed in which the action can occur in this animation style it, it's so impressive and it's even it's even better than it was in tales of the jedi which was better than it was in clone war season seven so uh, i love the progression can't wait to see more force users and, and lightsaber duelists here in the future yeah I, if there's a one negative about that is that it was so hard to screenshot that i just gave up <laughs> i just i just took the the result of the fight and the start of the fight because it is so fluid. And I mean, we've seen Asajj be this very martial oriented character, but I don't think we've ever seen her. I guess she's been more lethal than she has been non-lethal. And that might explain why her punches weren't so like rapid and like more just like peppering all of these, uh, you know, all the clones of Clone Force 99. But it was, it, it was sensational. And I, I feel like the animation extended off to like, the boat sequence and like it felt so realistic some of the shots i was like especially like that opening shot when they're coming into pabu right i was like that's too good looking right i was i was genuinely shocked i was like oh dang like that's how good they're making it right now i don't know i i i, I really don't know uh how and why this episode almost feels like another step up in animation is it just because again it's a it's a backdoor pilot for another, a new show with Quinlan, Asajj, maybe an Ahsoka appearance, who are, whoever's more force and like saving children who are force sensitive focused. Maybe we can mm -hmm. get the Corrin Horn that was teased in uh, the Kenobi show and some other names from EU that can be canonized again or canonized and then killed off. I don't know. We'll, we'll, we'll see how it's handled. Um, but like everything looked good. Like it looks even better than everything we've seen. And that's why I still feel like when I go back to season seven of the Clone Wars, I think Bad Batch's animation is awesome, but there's something so good and so smooth with the lighting and everything that I feel like it's like, is it after 
the Bad Batch episodes were already being made, right? I know there's always been rumors that they're deciding between the Bad Batch arc and the Martez sisters arc for that next show, which logically doesn't make sense with the animation pipelines, right? But I mean, I, I, I the more I see this, I'm like, okay, so then maybe we had these Bad Batch episodes from the first a season or so and then they finished up season seven's final couple arcs right and then they jumped into where we are right now in season three right and that's why the Saj one looks so good because they're already working on it i don't i don't know but the animation man it was it's so realistic it was so good like everyone's always like had some issues especially with the earlier clone wars animation like it looks so marionette-esque and fake and all that but now it's like other than some creative choices like making Dooku's face super long, this is as realistic as you can make characters be in animation. I love Resistance, Star Wars Resistance for its cell animation and how beautiful it looked there. And I love Rebels with its smoothness and its major improvements to lighting. But could I see, per se, like them being as like it stuck in my mind as like this is exactly how the character will look? No, and I think that's why like when the Ahsoka characters uh came out right like Hera was the only one I had some doubts on and then Mary Elizabeth Winstead blew, blew it out of the water right Natasha Liu Bordizo looked exactly like I thought Sabine would look realistically if anyone looked exactly like their character it was Iman Fani. he looked exactly like Ezra right and but that's harder because Rebels is even more stylist here now with this animation with the fluidity with the lighting and everything if we get any of these characters in live action around the same time period they have to like nail the casting now because it, it just feels spot on. Yeah, for sure. Absolutely. And and uh it's gonna be interesting to see if they if they have to do that where what direction they go. Um but it's an exciting problem to have, possibly. <laughs> um where were we here? Uh this is the way we talked about your comment about uh, Dark Disciple. Walker Lame Brain says now nah, it's the one and only original ventress or maybe her fake legends death we talked about that a little bit as well i mean that that idea was used a lot in legends to retcon people's deaths or to you know give a reason why jedi could fake their deaths you know luke luke had every power ever back then but <laughs> there's a lot of you know slowing your your heart to an untraceable level um luke mara you know a lot of those characters did that all the time but hey i mean that's not necessarily a wrong idea i think it could be possible it's just maybe it's even subconscious too you know she doesn't know she's doing that but um yeah they did bury her and you know she was dead for a little bit it wasn't like she died and then they left her five minutes later you know type of thing <laughs> like that's the thing where all this kind of like you know eats at me is like the story progressed there was she died and then there was more story after she died and then days later they you know went through moments and quinlan went through stuff with the jedi order and then uh quinlan and obi-wan went and buried her you know it was there was like a process to it she was probably dead for a good couple days at least um so we'll see where they want to juggle and, and you know all that uh <laughs> here coming up uh, this is the way elsa said uh we'll see how they handle it the green mist in the lake the Ventress was put into did leave an opening. Lucas's daughter didn't have to leave that opening unless she wanted to. to. Um, so, I mean, yeah, again, it's a good point. And Senex talked a lot about that already on the channel, the water of life and stuff like that. And, and, and frankly, it's not a bad way to retcon it. And personally, I'm not opposed to a retcon. I feel like I'm, I definitely have come off as somebody who's completely opposed to Ventress showing back up. I'm not. If there's a good reason and a good story, I'm Star Wars characters come back all the time. I'm not <laughs> opposed to it. Like you said, Maul is the perfect example. Um, a character that, frankly, you know, for thematical reasons, very well could have stayed dead. And it's like Obi-Wan conquers the Sith, right? Like that's a big moment in Phantom Menace to retcon that he didn't really, I mean, he still wins the battle, but he didn't kill Maul. You know, it's a big moment for him that you retcon, but it added so much great story. There were so many things there. And I, I just felt like the comments have made me even more nervous. The more we're talking, because it just it was like Maul, they brought Maul back with a purpose. Maybe the, the original idea was like, we want to bring Maul back because he's cool. But then they brought Maul back with a story that was attached to his appearances. Um, Ventress, the way I read those comments, some of it 
the subtext almost is we don't really know what we're doing with her yet, but she's back. Um, <laughs> and uh, that's where I get a little more nervous. But, you know, they very well could have a bunch of things in the uh, the pipeline. And I'm I'm cool with her back if she does have something really cool and interesting to tell here in the future. Yeah, full agreement. As long as it's worth it, then, you know, in a couple of years, maybe we're on a stream and we're like, oh, man, I love how she was she yeah. got her next chapter in life. Right now that she has a purpose outside of just, you know, Could be being a couple a of weeks. Could be a couple of weeks. Right. Uh, yeah. I'm I'm playing the long game. But <laughs> if we get it in a couple of weeks, man, it'll be great. Then we won't have to discuss it. And obviously, we'll we'll, we'll just discuss how happy we are. <laughs> but we won't have to be like, oh, will it happen? Will it happen? I'm nervous, right? Like the tightrope analogy will disappear, and I'll be walking on nice, solid sand, ground, asphalt, <laughs> whatever it may be, dura steel. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, we don't want to keep going and then, uh, you know, be like the flying Graysons on the tightrope, you know, like, don't want that to happen. Uh, But again, to go back to this is the way's comments about Ahsoka. I know I just threw it out there kind of randomly. I know you're mentioning the character of Ahsoka, not the Ahsoka show. But, um, you know, the Dothamirian stuff, the Night Sisters never before the first episode of Ahsoka or, you know, whenever we saw the Great Mothers for the first time, never in a million years would I have guessed the night sisters were going to be a, a major part of the story because they were all basically killed in in the clone wars right and uh father talzin even died and really the only one ha- we had was marin so i wouldn't have guessed we went to another galaxy where we found more night sisters and brought them back to dothamir um but in the same way where these great mothers exist ahsoka's had an allegiance with ventress um now these great mothers from another galaxy are coming into dothamir maybe Ventress, Marin, whoever's still alive at that time, maybe Ventress is the new great mother of Dathomir, a little secret coven of Night Sisters. Um, There could be some cool ideas there that I I certainly think would be very interesting to to explore. Um, Not that not that Ahsoka or the Thrawn adaptation or whatever needs any more characters really to be a part of this. (laughs) There's already a lot there. Um, not that we need more, but if that was something Dave Filoni was thinking about doing, I would be open to it as long as the story was interesting enough. Um, because old Ventress with great mother powers, you know, Mother Talzin always liked her, teaching her, you know, posthumously. We know Mother Talzin can communicate beyond the grave. It would be pretty, it would be pretty sick to see that story and pretty cool to see Ventress gain that level of power. It would be awesome, full circle moment for her character. Um, I would love to see it if the story was there. Yeah, we can only wait. <laughs> <laughs> um, back to uh, this is the way. It's all good on screen to some fans, though. Still more concrete. That is why some people don't have such a hard time with it, like myself. Yeah, I completely understand that. I mean, I get it. Um, I just, yeah, I just was hoping in this canon post uh, post legends that they were going to hold to the idea of sticking to to letting every story matter um it's not something it's something i'm disappointed in more so than upset because you know knew it was going to happen eventually uh, right it's been on the wall for many years now uh, colton smith says i don't think ventress in live action is very appealing she's clone wars character and feels right in animation i'd be frustrated if she goes live action almost disrespectful i disagree with disrespectful i think if the story's good doesn't matter whether, whether they're animation or not um i personally feel the opposite um i honestly feel like graduating to live action is a even greater um, show of respect than anything really because the hierarchy of star wars priority storytelling has always been and will always be movies or top tv live action tv is second uh animated tv is third video games are fourth then books then comics then whatever short stories and all the other stuff um so (laughs) that's the hierarchy of priority with uh respect to story i think a a graduation to live action tv i mean the only thing she could do better uh, to be given more respect is film but i do agree with you in the sense that um 
I prefer her have an arc in the animation as a respect to the fans, um, as a respect to her story. I'd prefer her story to conclude in animation now that they're reopening that door. Um, but if they had a great story in live action, I don't, I personally would be completely cool with it as long as it's great. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, I think a great example of like how we're going to handle this or appreciate it moving forward is the acolyte. And I know there's trolls online and everything, right. Who are like, Oh no, it looks terrible. This and that. Right. But if you're a high Republic fan, uh, what, what will be like really important to um, really consider is that Ernesta Rowe is like 116 years old or something like yeah. she's, she doesn't look that way. Right. I know she's a Moralian, right. So they're not supposed to age necessarily the same way. We've just never had a concrete definition for how they're supposed to age. Right. Are they like two times slower or something? We don't know. Yeah. And I, 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 I think, the Vernestra that we're getting in the books, obviously she's 16 and she's dealing with a lot of serious adult stuff and being a Jedi Knight, being a master to her apprentice, obviously what the Jedi are facing in the High Republic era right now. But Acolyte is set 100 years after that. We have no clue how much the books are going to influence that story. We have no clue why she's even in the story, right? Like there are hints that like some of the stuff that hasn't been fully addressed, including in our Defy the Storm review, which you should check out about like you know her strange abilities and visions and all that right maybe that's what they're saving for the tv show and then that'll make her feel super different and not be so tied in to what she was like when she was younger right so in that same way asajj ventress if it works out there why not have an asajj pop up right i know it starts becoming like the criticism of the whole mandiverse being like you can just put yeah, in every yeah, toy yeah. and like bring them out and make your own adventure but if there is a way to make her alive and avoid Cal Kestis, avoid the rebels and justify her existence until Ahsoka that, that you know doesn't necessarily feel as like choppy as sometimes Ahsoka's reasons for existence feel, then yeah, I think why not make her bold? Because then when she's old, she could be closer to a talisman, but have some of that spark that we recognize from her comics from her books from her obviously animation appearances but she doesn't have to be the same character when she's reached that advanced age right she she can be totally different i wouldn't say the obi-wan that we get in episode four is the same as the obi-wan we get in the phantom menace right not not at all there are some similar personality traits but they are quite literally two different people and we still work with that fine i know it is a little less of a timeline gap there but I, I still think if that works out in the Acolyte pretty well and it feels like two different characters, but the people who engage with both parts of her story to see like that connective tissue being well done, the same thing can happen here with Asajj. I agree. Uh, Walker Lambrain again says, since Asajj is confirmed to be the Harbinger, maybe next week's double episode is CX2 leading the invasion on Pabu. There is a teaser in the Bad Batch social media that briefly shows the Marauder will be blown up. Yes. I think you're pretty on point, personally. Um, I, I think next week, the way they've been building up since the last double episode with Rex being like, hey, you guys got to be careful because, you, you know, Omega is, is different. We got to figure out what's, why do they want her? Then you build it up again. This episode where Ventress is like, "Yeah, you guys are in trouble. If you don't get out of here, this place is not as safe as you think." I, I think they pretty much, <laughs> very directly, in very directly, indirectly said next week's episode is going to be <laughs> the um, the Pabu invasion episode. So, I would love to see CX two back next week. Continue. I mean, if he, if he only shows up every double episode, I would like to continue. Why is he still alive? What's important about him? That whole mystery was interesting. We haven't touched on in a couple weeks. So hopefully you're right. Hopefully he's back. And hopefully we see a cool battle here on Pabu and see, uh, you know, what maybe these uh, that Kraken creature comes back into the fold here, you know, we bring a lot of interesting stuff back that we built up on Pabu into this fight. Yeah, I mean, I am very curious to see if maybe Ventress is like, dang it, I just left, and now they're already in trouble, they don't have a ship, maybe give them a ride to 
Rex and Echo and then be like, all right, yeah, now we're, we're back. And, you know, it, 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 it'll be nice. It'll be fun to, you know, have her spend a few more minutes with Omega, maybe get some understandings. I don't know. Yeah. Oh, I mean, yeah, I don't know. Travis, you just pointed out there's the three clone kids are on Pabu. Uh, that would be wild uh, if they if they suddenly died like the rest of the Bad Batch dies and they become the new Bad Batch. I don't think that could happen right away. I feel like that's like something maybe that they can inherit post the show, right? I wouldn't I wouldn't put it in right now per se. <laughs> Yeah, I don't, I, I don't know if that quite happens, but I'd like to see them back. <laughs> Let's see what happens to them. Yeah. Um, going back to the top, Travis says, "Hi, how's it going, guys? Hi, Travis, how are you doing tonight? Uh, Walker says, you can see Wrecker and Gonky silhouettes when you pause that scene from the teaser. Hopefully Wrecker doesn't die next. Well, that's been, Wrecker's been one of our uh, candidates to die for sure in, in the Bad Batch because of the lack of, of character story they've they've really given him he is he is mostly now relegated to comedic relief and sometimes doing some cool fight scenes i did love <laughs> i wrote it in my notes as well again uh this week's episode i did love his <laughs> when omega was training and he's like all right omega you can do it you know that was just great use of record got a chuckle out of me is really sweet you know they they have some great moments for wrecker I could see him dying. Um, we've talked about everybody dying, you know, like Crosshair is our our odds on pick to die because it would be full circle for his arc, you know, comes back to the Bad Batch, saves their lives. That would be full circle. We've also talked about Hunter and Crosshair if they really want to get sad or really go for the, the gut punch there, have them team up because they've always been opposite sides of the coin and team up and, and have a last stand where the rest of the Bad Batch escapes or the rest of the clones escape. Uh, but Wrecker could be also, if you're going for the less gut punch, although it would be sad if he died, but if you're going for less of a character gut punch and more of like a, oh no, we're losing, you know, one of my my favorite, you know, side characters or pieces of the chemistry of the show, um, they could really go for an, uh, a sad death with Wrecker as well. So pretty much all of them are on the table. Um, but I don't know. I, I would be kind of surprised though, just as a last point, if they killed Wrecker in next week's episode like that to me, I feel like they would save it for the finale. But uh, who knows, though? that could be a huge surprise if they do. Yeah, I mean, I, I went through those frames as well, and I think his armor is going to take the brunt of it. I know he's not wearing his helmet, um, but it's also Star Wars. It's not going to be super realistic in some ways. Uh you know, there are clones like we had seen with like Fordo who have like completely decimated a bunch of clones. And then we see in the Battle of Christosis, that one clone who punches <laughs> Super Battle Droid, <laughs> grabs his hand and screams and then dies, right? But other clones have successfully punched through Battle Droids. It's like, it is a level of plot armor that every character has. I think Wrecker will survive being blown up because he is the type of guy who would survive being blown up out of the Bad Batch crew, right? Now, if there was Tech, who I believe is dead, right? But if it is Tech who was standing in front of the Marauder and it got blown up, I would think he's dead because he's basically just wearing, like, carpenter jeans and, like, overalls, right? Which is like, all right, that's not really enough there, buddy. But Wrecker, Wrecker's got, like, you know, he's, he's, got, he's got a big armor set. He's a big dude already. We've already seen half his face is super scarred, so he's definitely survived some crazy explosion or some attack on him before. So uh, it would be interesting to see how do they escape with Wrecker being in like a very damaged state that they need to like heal him or something. Maybe that's what brings them back to Asajj or brings them to Rex. Maybe they have to crash into some facility with the Juggernaut. I don't know. There, there's a there's a lot of possibilities uh, to like raise the stakes and have Wrecker be a little bit out of the action, but killing him off. I don't think so. I think it's a little too early for that. Uh, Travis knows us all too well at the bottom. I see uh, if Wrecker dies, at least we have Sid or do we, you know, but maybe Sid will come back and have a sacrificial death. Maybe we can get rid of her. Um, <laughs> 
Uh, okay, Go, scrolling back up, Travis says, I thought the scene with the green fish could have been representative of the green mist from the Night Sisters, Asajj being that misunderstood creature who emerges needing to be understood. Um, that's an interesting idea. I never really thought about it. Maybe a merging of, of her the force powers with her Night Sister magic. We know Ventress, well, again, from the end of Dark Disciple, which we don't know how. Uh, canonically accurate anymore that is we know she's trying to go back to the light or at least not embrace the dark she's not trying to become a jedi again but she's trying to walk the righteous path she's trying not to feed into her dark and so i wonder also like if they were to go that angle you know make her now like the queen of the night sisters right the new the new mother that's going to oversee a new generation of night sisters if that's the yeah. direction they want to take her in the future i wonder how much that line really is blurred between night sister magics and the dark side right because we we've always compared talzin to palpatine we've always um had the night sister magics be something that is dark side based especially in the reimagining of the night sisters that lucas and filoni did in star wars um the clone wars so since that, that this version of the night sisters their magics have always be very much so been part of the dark side's power set in a way but also at the, at the same time like talzin does have more compassion she does um have these things that are a little bit more light side in her personality than dark side but you know at the same time she's vengeful and wants to kill people and resurrects the dead and does stuff that's usually pretty dark right so uh it'll be interesting to see what line ventress crosses there um and if maybe some some dark side magics start to feed into her ability to use the force now that she's trying to not necessarily tap directly into the dark side yeah and she's gonna always be blurring the line that is kind of the point of her character that she's had so much trauma and so much difficulties from her early jedi training which in of itself was not never considered truly official because her own master in some ways was ostracized by the jedi order kind of left to just wander in the galaxy and die right which i'd love to see a lot more of kai Narek's story because he, he seems like mm -hmm. someone who could have a really interesting perspective on the force maybe he's a good old buddy with qui-gon or something i don't know right <laughs> maybe from the same youngling clan uh and you know, they, they both agreed to be like this and not like the others. It's just a, f a fun food for thought there. But um, I think it's also really important to note that, like, she's only really using, like, the Force. She's not really using Night Sister, Night Sister magic because she's not trained. And I know she was reborn. She's basically been baptized as, like, a Night Sister uh, in the Clone Wars when she's there with Savage and she's, like, renounced Dooku after Dooku leaves her for dead. But... Yeah, I don't know. I, I, I really, I do really wonder if uh, having her be a, like a future grandmother makes sense per se. Because even if she does, I know she's gone through some of the night sister training on her own with Dark Disciple and all that. But even if she were to be that, then what what happens with young Marin? Right, like Marin is some child. Is she just gonna let her be and not show off her existence there? I just don't think that whatever whatever she's going to do, even if she does eventually adapt more and more Night Sister magic, it can't be on Dathomir. It can't, she, she can't essentially return at this point if, um, unless she, she sees Marin and she's like, I don't have time for you. <laughs> I have another child to worry about, which would be a really terrible move. Um, you know, kind of going the whole point of her being a little bit more compassionate, being changed, like she's telling to the Clone Force, right? 99. So uh, I don't know if grandmother is the right thing word i'd say but you know being like a representative of how diverse the night sisters can be and especially if you look at the very early legends origins right there's also like a connection between the hoppins and the night sisters too which with obviously with the very different clans that were there uh, we don't really see as much diversity in canon with night sister clans uh and survivor or fallen order or the animated shows right maybe we this is a way to start like having her have her own like branch family where she's not necessarily the traditional night sister but that's kind of the whole point right and she's not on dathomir she's at a different you know dathomiri stronghold like 
maybe we go back to our original Legends origin where people thought she was a Zabrak, right? Or, or, or some other species. I forget the exact species she was. And she goes to that planet and that's where she has another one of her, like another place for the Night Sister at the Miri force influence to continue on. I don't know. Uh, but I, I don't think grandmother necessarily makes sense to me because Marin. I, I don't want Marin to just be ignored. I think she's becoming a more and more important character. Um, and she might be the version of a night sister that we see next if she does show up in live action with Cal Kestis. Yeah, and that's but that's the thing that makes me think she doesn't have ties to Dothamir much anymore is that she is now firmly entrenched in the Cal Kestis storyline, kind of part yeah. of this this uh new place he's going to be bringing for sensitives to um when on his new missions in jedi 3 like whatever that story is in jedi 3 it seems like it's intrinsically tied to the fact that Marin and and cal are like a, a thing now right like he goes where she goes she goes where he goes i don't see them really separating and i would love it if they made her a playable character obviously next game uh, that's a little side note but um yeah it'll be interesting to see like what they do with that i mean obviously um this version of the night sisters taking place in the clone wars dying before the clone wars ended i think a lot of that was to try to tie in the original like singing mountain clan and tanel ka and all those versions of the of the night sisters to see like these are the different clans maybe that were subjugated by obviously the darker night sisters like you see in in the original courtship of princess leia and in young jedi knights where you have um like the bad night sisters and the good night sisters and this time by killing off talzin and the other bad night sisters then the good night sisters can rise again on dothamir um i think that was originally their intent It'll be interesting to see if they go back to that for Ahsoka, like when the Great Mothers return to Dothamir, who's there and what's the population like? Um, but I think in my head, the trajectory of their stories, um, Ventress and, and Marin both don't have much tie to Dothamir, but Ventress at least has a little bit more tie to who, it, uh, who used to be in control of Dothamir and what the the rivals could be or at least the feloni side of top of here um that could line up for the future um but yeah marin better come back at some point as well but going back to travis here says last we saw mother talzin there was a cult sacrificing souls to resurrect her in season six before mace windu and of course jar jar binks stopped them yeah that was that was a good time <laughs> those were fun episodes i did enjoy them but yeah uh, do, do we dream. not have talzin <laughs> I'll um, double check this, but I'm pretty sure we have Talzin in Jedi um, Fallen Order in some form, like a voice. Um, uh, I'm, 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 sure, it. Um, let me look up. But yeah, there's Talzin's Beyond the Grave. And uh, at that, <laughs> but she could always come back in some way. Um, yeah, she, oh, she's mentioned in Fallen Order and Battle Scars uh doesn't look like she had an appearance maybe i just got that mixed up from something else but yeah she's part of the story and so um we'll see where it takes us here in the future uh nikhil says great analysis as always fellas thanks nikhil thank um, you ben bamboo i like that name <laughs> uh, with ventress back my head canon that shin is the love child of ventress and boss can actually become true there are a few things are wrong with that uh, theory, obviously, but uh, yes, it could hypothetically be true. Maybe, maybe an adopted child would be yeah. a little more, um, <laughs> a little more accurate to the look of the characters. I mean, if you're gonna say it's like a youngling that they save, right? Someone who could have been a youngling at the temple, they save, uh, you know, uh, what is it, Quinlan and Assad save her. But then Balin comes and he's like, how dare you corrupt her from the way the Force should really be handled, the true Jedi teachings, you Quinlan, you maverick already, and your brushes with the dark side, and Asajj Ventress obviously can't be trusted, thought you were dead too, so you must be some abomination, right? So in that same way, <laughs> maybe Balin it comes tied into the story. Like if, if we manage to get like a Balin episode in like a Hidden Pats spinoff animated show or something Tales of the Jedi or whatever, 
that'd be insane. Um, I want to see what he was doing during the dark times because he's a character I feel like lays low for the most part, but definitely, definitely did pick up Shin at some point, right? And it's, I would assume, closer towards the start of a lot of these battles and the Galactic Civil War, but there is no guarantee that we really know how young Shin is either. She could be like 40, but she looks super young. I don't know. Like, we don't yeah, know how to go there too. Like... <laughs> and it looks like Walker just went there as well. Like Shin, um, it, they kind of play it to be like she and, and Sabine are the same age, but Sabine, frankly, is is a lot older than you think too in the Ahsoka yeah. series. Like She's almost she's, 30. Yeah, because yeah, if we give her, let's say... I don't know exactly how old I'm going to look it up for, for complete accuracy, but let's give her like 17, 18 in the beginning of rebels by the end of rebels. Let's see. She's born in 21 BBY. So that is uh, three years before the dark times start or two years before the dark times start. So that's 19 years. She's, um, she's 28. She's 21. Yeah. She's 21 by the time we get to zero BBY, obviously. Um, so then Ahsoka being five years after Return of the Jedi is nine more years. So she's 30, exactly 30 years old, somewhere in her, maybe 29 to 31, somewhere in that range, um, or close to 31 in Ahsoka. So uh, Shin, I think at least they play her off to be a lot younger than that. So yeah. I would guess she's... Shin is around 20. I think the Anakin age, Attack of the Clones, Anakin age, about that age, 19, 20. Um, so she would be, but it, I mean, it could still work. It could still work if you did, if she was their kid from the end of the dark times. Right. Uh, yeah. But yeah, she wouldn't be able to be born soon. <laughs> but I think this yeah. is all hypothetical, anyways. Um, I, I'm not sure I really want to consider Quinlan and Asides birthing very powerful children when there's already everyone complaining online like oh my god Luke and Leia aren't the only like potential Jedi's like well yeah I guess <laughs> <laughs> and Travis says Sid is the love child of Yoda and Vernestra Rowe <laughs> there's a visual. Buddy, I, I know we joke about Sid, but that's only because we don't like her. <laughs> like, don't, don't, don't you dare mess with Yoda and Vernestra like that. <laughs> Maybe she's Boss's grandma. <laughs> um, who else, what else we got here? Okay, we'll go. We're gonna go for a, just a little bit longer. So again, if you want your questions sent in, send them in. And if you want to make sure we get to it, send in a super chat. Helps the channel out, and you get your question answered. Uh, but again, up to you. We'll continue to work our way down here. Uh, Travis Mitchell says, just remembered those three kids. that We read that one already. Um, Walker says, frustrating to see the Bad Batch doesn't take Ventress warning seriously. Yeah, I think it. I, the Bad Batch in general have often needed to learn by uh, things <laughs> happening to them in a bad way. So this will once again, they'll let the entire city of Pabu or the entire planet of Pabu get invaded by the Empire, and then they'll be like, shucks, we should have listened to everybody telling us what to do this whole show. Um, yeah, it's, it's a constant, but it's going to happen. Um, Walker also says if they all die in the finale, uh, Omega's only choice would be to go with Ventress, which that could be interesting. I, I just, I really don't see them killing the entire Bad Batch in the show. Somebody's going to live. I know Omega's a member, but I, somebody's gonna live i i really do think it's wrecker and hunter who live but uh who knows that would be the way to start your hypothetical uh pilot here for the omega the adventures of omega and ventress buddy cop uh team up here for the second series that's coming after the bad match setting yeah i i mean i i guess i i you could right i i agree i don't think they'll all die i think if Omega does go adventurous and she is truly force sensitive instead of just special in the way the midichlorians interact with beings, right? Um, then, uh, yeah, I guess having her voluntarily leave because she needs to do that might right. be a better idea to me. Having it be like, oh no, like everyone's dead, so therefore Ventress will take her in because she showed her sympathy to some degree after making her go on these crazy tests and missions. 
for one random episode of the Bad Batch's final season. I don't know. I don't think that's enough. I think you have to really, and you, you really need to like consider that, like, hey, why would Omega be doing this? Why would she put herself in a position where she's further at risk, right? By, by becoming a trained individual, she's also drawing attention to herself and Ventress, and this fight never ends. Like, when does her fighting stop? When does she free herself of? The struggles that she's already had during these last two and a half seasons what comes next for her i think that's going to be more key right like what mm-hmm. eventually separates her from this inevitable uh, you know t- t- like unending chase that she's been forced to live her life through ever since she left camino yeah I, I there was a bit of me that honestly thought um at the end of this episode when she walks towards ventress when she ventress is standing by her ship that we were going to have an episode where Omega goes with Ventress for an episode and, and we see what happens there. Um, but of, of course it did not happen. Happen. Uh, moving on to the next one, Travis said about record. And then Walker said in last season's finale, when the empire showed up and sits bar, if Mando's tried stunning record, but it didn't work, although it did help them cuff him. Yeah. So he is pretty tough. Uh, Travis then says there's a shot with her using the force where she goes from open hand to a fist back to an open hand showing she still struggles. That's a good point with, uh, with Ventress and she is struggling. That will always be her struggle. Um, I I think it's interesting. I mean, in a way it does parallel what they're trying to do with Marin as well, but um, that ability to the channel, the dark side versus, and while you're working with people from the light side and your hearts on the light side, uh, I, I think it's an interesting struggle to to show. I mean, we've seen how the dark side in the past has been almost akin to like, you know, uh, uh, drugs in a way where you, you have a hard time kicking it. And we've seen that with a lot of dark side users where it's it's hard to push back that constant call. Um, and so, or, or the instinct to use it. Um, I would, I'm mean, in that way it would be now that, now that Ventress is back, right? Where like, and that's the thing about this is Ventress is back there's nothing we can do about it she's back so let's (laughs) that is an interesting angle to take her how do we see her grow and how do we see her change in an era really where she's going to be forced to fight to stay alive and somebody who you would think would frankly be on the high end of the priority list of uh targets the empire would want to kill because she is so involved in the separatist side of the Clone Wars, not just a force sensitive. So um, I think there's a lot of cool, interesting story you can do with her in this time. Again, not a reason to bring her back, but now that she is back and we can't do anything about it, tell those stories. I very much so want to see them. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I, I can't, I'm just waiting at this point. <laughs> I hope, she- I hope, I hope she gets, a little bit more composed or chooses one or the other um and we get to have a cool story about it but if she's just always like in the middle i think that could get pretty tiring if we get like a show out of her maybe max right. a season for her to deal with that yeah, travis said she felt like an npc in this episode where she kind of just stood there and let people ask her questions <laughs> and then start spilling information that was what this whole that's why this episode felt so weird man like it just I felt like it should have been this really awesome comeback episode for Ventress. And and still those people in the chat who are still watching who do love Ventress and didn't read any of the books, like what were your thoughts really? Cause like, I felt like this was generally an underwhelming episode, even from that angle. Like she just kind of shows up. She's like, I'm going to give you three tests, Omega kind of like, you know, the last Jedi three t- trials type thing. And none of them really had to do with any, like, I don't know how she could tell if she's more sensitive or not through that. She even, Ventress even makes a comment on the boat where she's like, yeah, for people who aren't trained in the force, like, it, it's hard to get in touch with it. I'm like, yeah, so what, why are these, how are these tests going to suddenly, I was glad Omega just didn't suddenly learn how to use the force after these three tests because it was just super random. Like, I don't know why, I thought she was going to be like, yeah, I have some com link or some way to test blood with for midichlorian counts because i'm a bounty hunter and i've been hunting for the empire um and they gave us this or the, like you know i'm aware of the empire's hunts and i stole some technology 
and they gave these to people to verify that they're force sensitive or had a high midichlorian count or, or she just knew a way to do it because she was tested on by the Jedi originally, you know, it's like something that would allow us to confirm that, but it was just kind of this, this strange, like we're going to do some trials and then we're also going to have some like separatist Republic conflict and then she's going to leave. And so, yeah. So for me, it was just kind of a strange episode. Um, if Ventress wasn't in it, it would have been a super fillery type of episode. <laughs> like honestly, almost more filler than last week. I agree. I agree. But she was in it. We just got to wait and see. Maybe by next week we'll be like, she's back. And she's there to warn you. Like, these fools haven't left Pabu yet. Like, what are you doing? Right? Like, I told you. And now they're here. Run. And then by the time she leaves and they come, it's just not enough time for the Bad Batch to fully escape or something. Right? Mm -hmm. If that's just the next time we see her, and then she, like, gives them a place to go. Right? And they fail to get there immediately, but maybe they do by the end of the season. That's good for me. Like that we're at least going to be like, all right. And then Omega's like, wait, don't like go. Like, aren't you going to help? She's like, I'll help you when you need your, when the time is right. When, you know, I can truly help you, right? Come here. And, be, and then maybe that name of the planet or the facility or whatever makes canon junkies or legend junkies go like, oh my God, that's, that's super important to her character. So I'm like, I don't know. We'll see. Yeah, well, I think that kind of wraps it up here. We're approaching about an hour and a half, but thank you to everybody who did send in chats and comments, and we appreciated talking about the Bad Batch with, the, with you all. Again, a uh, double episode next week, so make sure you join us. Hopefully it will be some big plot-heavy stuff. Since the last two weeks were kind of sparse on plot, uh, so hopefully next week there's some excellent stuff with Pabu and like Senek was saying, Ventress is back, and we can talk about all of that. Stay tuned for predictions. They will be coming up. Uh, we did it Sunday last week. Released that because of the Defy the Storm review that just came out yesterday. Again, check that out if you are interested in the High Republic. Um, but, you know, if if you guys are interested in seeing it a day early, gives you a bit more time before the episode comes out. We might start doing them Sunday releases. But stay tuned for next week's predictions. Uh, again, it's a holiday weekend, so we might slow down a little bit on the stuff that's coming out here for right before the weekend, but uh, we'll have plenty more out. Got some more shorts coming your way, and again, the bracket actually tomorrow is finally the final of that that bracket for the best uh, Star Wars movies and TV shows, so if you're interested in voting in that and you haven't voted, we've been ranking them from number 20 all the way to number one over the last week or so based on your guys' choices. So stay tuned for that. Tomorrow is Revenge of the Sith versus The Empire Strikes Back. Uh, it's finally coming, so make sure you vote in that. Uh, as always, stay tuned for these reviews. We're going to be talking about it on Wednesday, 7 p.m. Pacific next week. And that's going to do it for this week's episode. If you haven't liked the video, again, please do so. It helps us out a lot. Subscribe if you're new. If you're watching on replay, join us 7 p.m. Pacific Wednesday evenings for the latest Bad Batch reviews and discussions and all that. Hopefully 10 and 11 are awesome episodes next week. Thank you all so much for watching this week's stream. And we will see you all.